Good morning. Good morning. We come today to worship together, to be together, here in this hall and across time and space. Welcome. I'm Reverend Joyce Palmer, and my pronouns are she, her, hers. Our worship team this morning includes Lindsay Trank, Director of Religious Education, Worship Associate Libby Parker. Playing music for us this morning is Lisa Red. Autumn Powell is our office manager, and she's running the tech for us today. We're happy to have Reverend Monica Kling Garcia with us today as well. Reverend Monica will deliver the message. Reverend Monica uses they, them pronouns and serves as the lead staff chaplain and palliative care chaplain at Unity Point Meritor Hospital in Madison. As a chaplain, Reverend Monica's theology is one which emphasizes relationships and storytelling with her patient, their patients. When not in the hospital, you can find Reverend Monica enjoying a good movie or video game with their husband, Logan, who is also here today, and their energetic cat, Yen. Welcome, Reverend Monica. If you're online, hello. Do like, comment, and share this worship service and engage with, e with each other in the replies or comments section. If you are in person, do join us for coffee hour. I think I sell treats today after the service. The noise of children is always welcome here, but please do silence your electronic devices. If today is your first day worshiping with us, online or in person, we are very glad that you are here. Let us know who you are so that we can be in touch. I invite you now to turn to those around you and say hello, good morning, shake hands, nod, however you like to greet one another. Let us worship together. Our opening hymn is a song about unconditional welcome. Several of us met yesterday together to talk about widening the welcome here at UU Church Rockford. We learn to maintain a spirit of invitation and listening with everyone that we meet. The most important thing we can do is honor the holiness of each person we meet. So in the spirit of widening the welcome, let us rise and body our spirit to sing and around, come, come, whoever you are. We're going to wait for instruction. <laughs> okay, the first half of this side is going to be number two. The back half is going to be number one. First time in history. <laughs> and this group is going to be number three. We'll sing it through once in unison, twice as a round, and when you get to come yet again come at the end, just keep repeating it until we all are in together. So come and come, come.
Good morning. I'm Libby Parker, your worship associate today. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. We are worshiping in the homeland of indigenous Ho-Chunk people and are humbled to be on this sacred ground. This land, this country, this liberal faith, and our very lives are inherited from the complicated intersections of oppression, freedom, resistance, migration, war, justice making, and hope. From these legacies we learn, grow, seek repair, give thanks, and build a better world for those who will inherit our choices. We gather today for worship, and as we gather, we join in our sacred ritual. The flaming chalice is the symbol of our faith, a beacon of truth, a fire for justice, a warmth for the soul. Our president, Spiti Tata, and I don't know what he likes or how old he is, <laughs> will light our chalice today. <laughs> Let us speak together the covenant of our church. Love is the spirit of this church, and reason is its guide. To dwell together in peace, to seek truth in freedom, and to serve human need. This is our covenant. Now, let's sing together our chalice response song. We gather and worship together. We begin with the prayers of the people, the naming of joy and sorrow, the holding in heart of those we love. We hold in our hearts all those recovering from illnesses and experiencing maladies of body or soul. May mercy and healing attend them. I invite you in this space to name those aloud or in silence, who you are holding in your heart today. Let us continue our call to worship with the reading, All That We Share is Sacred, by Andre Mole. The blessing was written in honor of two Unitarians, Martha and Wait Still Sharp, who during World War II dared to risk their own comfort in order to help save the lives of those in desperate need. As we gather together, may we remember when you share with me what is important to you, that is where listening begins. When I show you that I hear you, when I say your life is precious, that is where compassion begins. When I open the door to greet you, that is where hospitality begins. When I venture out to bring you shelter, that is where love begins. When I risk my comfort to ease your suffering, when I act against hatred, violence, and injustice, that is where courage begins. When we experience the full presence of each other, because of our shared humanity, because of our differences, that is where holy gratitude begins. May this space be a table that is not complete until all are welcome. May this table be a space of beauty where together we create a series of miracles and where all that we share is sacred. May it be so. Let us worship together.
Good morning. I'm Lindsay Trank, and I'm the Director of Religious Education here at the church. My pronouns are she and her. And our story this morning is an old favorite, Swimmy, by Leo Liani. <clears throat> a happy school of little fish lived in a corner of the sea somewhere. They were all red. Only one of them was as black as a mussel shell. He swam faster than his brothers and sisters. His name was Swimmy. One bad day, a tuna fish, swift, fierce, and very hungry, came darting through the waves. In one gulp, he swallowed all the little red fish. Only Swimmy escaped. He swam away in the deep, wet world. He was scared, lonely, and very sad. But the sea was full of wonderful creatures, and as he swam from marvel to marvel, Swimmy was happy again. He saw a medusa made of rainbow jelly. A lobster who walked about like a water-moving machine. Strange fish pulled by an invisible thread. A forest of seaweeds growing from sugar candy rocks. An eel whose tail was almost too far away to remember. And sea anemones who looked like pink palm trees swaying in the wind. And then, hidden in a dark shade of rocks and weeds, he saw a school of little fish, just like his own. Let's go and swim and play and see things, he said happily. We can't, said the little red fish. The big fish will eat us all. But you can't just lie there, said Swimmy. We must think of something. Swimmy thought and thought and thought. And then suddenly he said, I have it. We are going to swim all together like the biggest fish in the sea. He taught them to swim close together, each in his own place. And when they had learned to swim like one giant fish, he said, I'll be the eye. And so they swam in the cool morning water and in the midday sun and chased the big fish away. And we'll head outside for religious education. I hope you are subscribed to the Kairos, our weekly newsletter. Be sure to read it for announcements about upcoming events and activities. This week, I want to highlight that our next two Sundays are Bring a Friend to Church Sundays. Reverend Matthew will reflect on the topic of taking Unitarian Universalism seriously. So I'd like to share with you some information from an article about church and friends published by the Unitarian Universal Association some time ago. So let's start with some statistics. 70 to 90% of people who join a congregation have a friend or relative in the congregation. 75 to 90% visit because someone invited them. We know that the most frequent way in which people hear about us is through word of mouth. However, the average Unitarian Universalist only invites a person to church once every 26 years. <laughs> so what's up with that? Why are we so hesitant to invite people to our congregation? So here's something that may surprise you. The short-term goal of a Bring a Friend to Church Sunday is not to increase membership. The short-term goal is to enable our friends, neighbors, and loved ones to experience the place that has brought us such joy and meaning. The immediate purpose is to spread the good news about Unitarian Universalism. Let me share a story with you from the article. There was a blind child who was sitting on the pavement. They held a sign up which said, I am blind, please help. There were only a few coins in the bowl. A man was walking by. He took a few coins from his pocket and dropped them into the hat. He then took the sign, turned it around, and wrote some words. 
he put the sign back so that everyone who walked by would see the new words. Soon, the hat began to fill up. A lot more people were giving money to the child. That afternoon, the man who changed the sign came to see how things were going. The child recognized his footsteps and asked, were you the one that changed my sign this morning? What did you write? The man said, I only wrote the truth. I said what you said, but in a different way. What he had written was, today is a beautiful day and I cannot see it. When we invite people to Friendship Sunday, the sign we're displaying should not be, we need more members, please help. It should be, we have a beautiful congregation and a beautiful building, and you haven't seen it. When we are inviting people because we want them to meet the people and see the places that have brought us so much joy and meaning, and we want them to see it because they as well have brought us so much joy and meaning in our lives. So please bring a friend or a neighbor or a loved one to church with you for the next two Sundays and beyond. Next, we'll hear from the auction planning team about our upcoming auction. Alexis is making her way. Hello, I'm Alexis. Uh, my pronouns are she and hers. I am the co-chair of the auction this year. You may have seen me at the front accosting you with my small children. Uh, <laughs> the reason being is that the auction is coming up very soon. It is September 23rd at 6 p.m. Um, we are in need of donations. This is the church's largest fundraiser. And for some reason, I'm in charge, despite being a very new member, and probably most of you don't know me. Um, but here we are, and we'd like to make it successful. Um, we're having a fun theme, Oktoberfest. Uh, so we plan to have beer, obviously, um, and also some Oktoberfest-themed appetizers. So please come, please donate. If you have questions, um, we've got Katie, my co-chair's email, on our handout, which you should have seen when you walked in the door this morning. So as far as what to donate, anything you would like. Um, it can be a thing, it can be a service, um, it can be uh, your skill set, so if you um, are good at mending things like some people are, they could teach how to do that uh, for an hour. Um, if you like to paint and you want to share your skills, you could donate that, or you could donate traditional things like um, a massage or a gift certificate, Not probably not a massage by you to someone else, but a, a gift certificate would be a good idea. So. Uh, if you need more ideas, I'm available to give you them. Thank you. We now take an offering to support the work of justice and mercy in the world. 80% of what's collected today will go to fund um, uniforms for school children in our area. Having the right clothing allows children to focus on their studies and not worry about having their uniforms. So thank you so much for your generosity. The offering will now be given and most gratefully received.
I can go up okay, it's just going down. I must confess that I like the idea of playing a board game. I like the thought of the camaraderie and the fun. And when I play a game, I love seeing how others strategize, how they hunker down and concentrate, and how they exult in winning. The few times I played with older family members growing up, I was always trounced. That's what can happen when you're a younger, gullible sibling. My brain didn't work out formulas or how to manipulate others. I would feel sorry if someone couldn't move for several turns because I knew how it felt when that happened to me. My older brother and sister were much more into winning whatever it took. I was just happy that they included me, but I hated losing. I just whined and complained and stomped off. I was a terrible loser. When I think of how far board games have progressed from the oldest one we know of today, which is Senate, uh, it was a game enjoyed by Tutankhamun and Queen Nefertari. To today's RPGs, their role-playing games, this just shows how much human beings enjoy stretching their thinking muscles in ways not connected to work. However, I love that some people have developed board games in their chosen professions to help people learn, too. One person was a teacher at a middle school in Bellevue, Washington, where I was employed as an aide. Jack Zarin invented and eventually marketed It's Your Future, a package of life skills lessons on such topics as finding a job, writing a check, paying bills, making health care decisions. The kids really liked it. It was fun, but it was instructive. And uh, he uh, sold the lesson kit to hundreds of schools, community colleges, prisons, and social service agencies around the US and Canada. He later repackaged some of It's Your Future's lesson points into Struggle, a board game he sold through Nordstrom stores for eight years. It was clever, and as, as I said, his classes really enjoyed learning. A board game I learned from was Monopoly. I learned that money comes and goes out alarmingly fast. <laughs> and, and buying hotels and homes on ritzy streets wasn't all it was cracked up to be. Playing Parcheesi taught me that a blocked road can halt traffic forever. I learned you can use wooden matchsticks for crippage pegs when playing with your grandmother. And also that your grandmother was a lot better in math than you were. Our eldest son, Stefan, began playing Dungeons and Dragons in his early teens. In his later teens, he worked the phones teaching people how to get to the next level in Nintendo. He had a successful career with Wizards of the Coast who made the Magic Card series, and also was the company who eventually produced Dungeons and Dragons. Now, for the past several years, he's happily working for Pokemon. He, his wife Dina, and daughter Mia are rabid gamers, and any time we have visited, we come away with at least one new game to play with friends. I toddle along. RPGs are just too much work for my brain. They are like story problems in math class. I can't keep all the bits and pieces of storyline in my head. Just give me a good game of sorry, and I'm happy. <laughs> Please rise, embody your spirit, for we laugh, we cry, verses one and four.
Our reading today is called Show Up Hungry by Elizabeth Nguyen. I got off work at 7 p.m. and did the thing where you chase the bus a little, but then you realize you won't make it, and then walk sheepishly back to the bus stop. I'm already an hour late to Sunday night singing at the Lucy Stone Cooperative, a UU affordable housing co-op in Boston. I'm still ambivalent. I could go home to Netflix and grilled cheese. I could choose predictability and warm carbs. Or I could get on the bus to this community where I was first a member of the planning team and now a board member, this place where, despite my leadership role, I still find myself questioning whether and how I belong. I give myself a little pep talk reminding myself that I'm allowed to show up late and hungry and in need of a song. Reminding myself that being in community means offering care and being cared for, bringing my shiny self and my not so shiny self. When I arrive, there's a teapot of hot water and a plate of fat dates on the table. A friend presses a bowl into my hands and there's broccoli soup. We sing Amazing Grace. The wonders of accepting love have made me whole and real. Community is covenant. It's the promise of a bowl of soup and a song at the end of the day. It's love in the form of a house on Moreland Street that has said it doesn't matter that I don't live there, that I too am welcome on Sunday nights. Laid bare, it is the sucre and accountability of doing that thing together that we cannot do alone. Now, I've not always been my best self in the communities I've loved. I've shirked dish duty at Lucy Stone, and I've missed a lot of weddings in my hometown. I've dropped out when I was needed and showed up full of pettiness and exhaustion. The wonder of accepting love is only made evident when we're allowed to shed the shiny and let the sourness show. Our communities of spirit are only real because we show up late expecting to be fed, because we both give and get. We are part of community when we show up shiny and not shiny, when we ladle soup into each other's bowls and eat it eagerly when we bring our sour and our sweet, when we shed the shiny and show up hungry. I invite you now into a time of centering and meditation. Take a deep cleansing breath. Our words for centering are by Mary Oliver, The Summer Day. Who made the world? Who made the swan and the black bear? Who made the grasshopper? This grasshopper, I mean. The one who has flung herself out of the grass. The one who is eating sugar out of my hand. Who is moving her jaws back and forth instead of up and down, who is gazing around with her enormous and complicated eyes. Now she lifts her pale forearms and thoroughly washes her face. Now she snaps her wings open and floats away. I don't know exactly what a prayer is. I do know how to pay attention how to fall down into the grass, how to kneel down in the grass, how to be idle and blessed, how to stroll through the fields, which is what I've been doing all day. Tell me, what else should I have done? Doesn't everything die at last and too soon? Tell me, what is it you plan to do with your one wild and precious life? Let us sit together in a moment of silence.
Board games have always been an important part of my life. Growing up, I have many fond memories of sitting together as a family for a weekend game night. We'd spend time, a lot of time, discussing and picking out the perfect game, which this was its own challenge uh, in a family of six. Some of my favorite games growing up were Sorry, Charades, specifically we had this Disney version with Mickey Mouse ears, um, as well as Clue. For our family, games were more than just about winning, although winning was always preferable. We had our own house rules, our inside jokes, and precious memories attached to each game. This carried into adulthood. For my husband and I, board games are an important symbol of community to our family. We have two bookshelves full of games, and we actually even had a board game themed wedding where we gave games away to our guests. Now, we love the opportunities to gather with people together and to socialize, but we love the games themselves and how they require equal parts thoughtfulness and imagination. Whether we are guarding an imaginary castle from invaders or we are solving a curious mystery, the games are made more fun by the people we play them with. As the saying goes, art imitates life, and in some ways, board games are no different. While board games are excellent entertainment, they also have their own lessons to teach us about what it means to be part of a community, and, oh, excuse me, and how to work together, or how not to. Trace back to as early as ancient Egypt, Board games have been around throughout history as ways for people to entertain themselves. Different types of games that people have played you know, vary from time and place in history, but they can involve um, you know, minimal pieces or they can be quite extravagant. You know, I'm sure each of us has our own favorite games that we have fond memories associated with. So many of these beloved board games have one main objective, for you to win and all of your family and friends to lose. I feel your pain. <laughs> so the specifics of how this happens varies from game to game. You know, some games like the deduction game of Clue or the dice game of Yahtzee, for example, require you to figure out the answer first or simply get the best score. Your actions are not intentionally to sabotage others and largely don't affect them, but rather you are trying on your own to win like a race. Other games like Monopoly or Sorry are games where your actions uh, directly affect others and in fact you are encouraged to sabotage everyone else's progress. Whether it be uh, buying key properties or just knocking someone's piece back to start, part of winning is not only to do better, but to guarantee that everyone else loses. So these are all great games and they are really fun to play. However, if we just step back for a moment and take a look, we can see that these games really reward certain behaviors prioritizing your own interests, stopping others from succeeding, or just being better than everyone else. And while these are fun, low-stakes games, these skills don't really apply to life in the same way. I mean, if we put other people down, we, if we try to make sure only our needs are met, or we simply ignore the rest of the community in a race to the goal, it's hard to imagine the result of that being a healthy and thriving community. While one person might achieve their goal, others in the community are left out and the group as a whole suffers. Now, we don't look, need to look hard to see how this mentality, winning at the expense of others, plays out in our world. We see corporate greed and billionaires hoarding wealth while many struggle for food and housing. Just an example, according to the Pew Research Center this year for the first half of the year, the top or wealthiest 10% of American households hold a disproportionate 69% of the total wealth of Americans, 
while the lower 50% of Americans together combined only have 2.4% of the total wealth. Success in our society is often equated with having the most and keeping it to oneself so that only a few win and everyone else loses. As Unitarian Universalists, we seek to have our religious communities be a reflection of our values and a vision for what the world can be. We become part of a congregation, not just for ourselves, but to be part of a community. We want to see each other succeed, grow our souls, and help the important work of the church in making a better and more just world. Through our covenants, as a covenantal community, we make promises to each other to live into our values and support each other, not just ourselves. But what does that really mean? The UUA's um, Congregational Life Staff says this about covenants. A covenant is the silk that joins Unitarian Universalist congregations, communities, and individuals together in a web of interconnection. The practice of promising to walk together is the precious core to our creedless faith. Now, every congregation has different variations of covenants, whether it be for the whole church or individual com committees. We said one together at the beginning of the service. As part of this community, these statements reflect how we promise to live out our values of peace, love, and service, both within and outside of our church. And when we eventually fall short of our promises, because sometimes we will, having a shared covenant gives us the language to remind one another of that shared commitment to walk together and bring each other back into our community. Being in covenant together means that we journey through the game of life. We agree that living our values means we share our gifts. We help each other when we are in need, and we work together towards our goals guided by our values. So I promise I'm going to get back to board games. Tying it back into our metaphor, is there a board game out there that actually can model this kind of mentality? I think so. It's a style of board games that is increasing in popularity called cooperative board games. In this type of board game, all of the players are working together towards a common goal, where it's kind of everybody versus the game itself. The board game usually has some sort of timed element to it, making it really important for all the players to work together to win. In this style of game, there's no hierarchy of winners or losers. Either everybody wins or everyone loses together. So to illustrate this, since this may be a new idea for many, I'd like to share an example of one of my favorite cooperative board games, Forbidden Island. So Forbidden Island is a game where you and all of your other players are adventurers, and you're on a deserted island. This is represented by cardboard island pieces. So they're square pieces interlocking on the board. So each of the players, or the adventurers, as you all are in your imaginations, you're trying to find four magical artifacts that are these delightful shiny pieces placed on this board of island pieces. So um, after you begin the game, pieces of this island begin to disappear. And so they are removed on a timed basis throughout the game. So the object of this game is, as a team, kind of Indiana Jones style, to collect all of the artifacts and then make sure everyone gets to escape before the whole island disappears. So to aid you on this quest, players are given a hand of cards, and you can share them with each other. They have different um, resources, and you're encouraged to strategize together openly during the game. So the only way to win is to work together, to communicate, and to share what you have. When we think about our church as a covenantal community, at our best, we are more like a cooperative board game than a competitive one. We share what we have with each other. We work towards a common goal with the same obstacles. 
It's not about who is more right or who wins, but about how we get there and play the game. And really, no one wins until we all win. Now, it's important to note that working together, even in a cooperative board game, is not without conflict. I mean, sometimes even when working together towards a common goal, players of these games experience arguments and intention over what is the right move to ensure success for the whole team of players. There is discussion and different players might actually have completely different suggestions about what to do next. But the only way a team can successfully beat a cooperative board game like Forbidden Island is if they work together and reach compromise and repair relationship in effective ways. If someone treats the game like a competitive board game, keeping all their resources to themselves, prioritizing the moves they want to make, or preventing moves of other players, everyone loses the game. You need everyone to cross the finish line together. If life is a board game, then congregational life is doing the work of showing your hand of cards, who you are and what you have to offer. It is sharing the resources you have to help others in the community who are in need, and sharing when you are in need yourself. It is recognizing that how we journey together is often more important than the destination, and that we do it in a spirit of love and service. In today's reading, Show Up Hungry, our author represents the best of this UU covenantal community when we work together. You know, even though she was coming late and exhausted, she knew that she could ask to be taken care of and fed by her community. She knew that she could show up as she was and that they would support her. And she knew that the focus of Lucy Stone wasn't who was on time or who brought what or who held what position in the organization, but rather simply who is there and what do they need. Another example of cooperative community outside of our churches uh, was in Olympia, Washington, where the East Side neighborhood was concerned about rising crime rates in the area. So after a group of volunteers in the neighborhood conducted a survey, they found that the majority of people shared if they knew, they, if they knew their neighbors better, uh, they would feel safer. So what came out of that were a series of neighborhood events hosted by different groups and families on the east side. These ranged from dinners to a winter walkabout to look at Christmas lights to this huge variety talent show that had over 80 participants and an intermission in the middle. <laughs> After all of this, the community was much more closely connected to each other. And they actually were asked by the local government to form a group to be able to share with the local government initiatives. So they realized that the best way to get a safer neighborhood was through actually becoming a closer community. This focus on relationships is part of what it means to be Unitarian Universalist. The reality is that the work of our community is only successful when we work together. And part of the promise we make to each other through our covenants is that we work to support our whole community. And when we forget that, it is how we make things right with those we hurt that brings us back. Being in a religious community like ours doesn't mean we have to be perfect. It just means that we have to have love at the center of what we do. And this is not easy work, and it is not how uh, we have been taught to be in the world. You know, if we look to the news, we see a nation that is driven by winning, getting ahead, exclusivity, prejudice. We can see how the work we are called to do is so pertinent to the world today. But when I look to all of us who are gathered here, I have hope. What we learn here about engaging in life together, it does not just stay here, but it changes us. And then we go out and we change others. And then they go out and they change others that they know. And this starts a ripple effect out into the world. I believe that we have the power to work together and make our world a better place, starting with what we do right here. 
As a board game enthusiast, you know, my favorite part about cooperative board games is that whenever it is my turn in the game, I am never going in alone. And the moments where I'm handed the die and I just blank, feel the panic of not knowing what to do, I actually have a whole team there to talk to and decide what's the best move to make. And that is what I want to leave you all with today. The knowledge that as a part of this church community, you too are not going through life alone. Whether it be your ministers, your board, or your fellow church members, they are all right beside you to help you when you need it. We're all on this journey, this game of life together. Thank you for that message. I'm going to invite you all now to rise and body your spirit for our closing hymn for all that is our life. Libby will extinguish our chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry with us until we are together again. While she does that, I invite you to join hands for our benedictions. If you'd rather not be touched, place your hands in your pockets or on your shoulders. The words of our benediction are from Cynthia Landrum. We leave this gathered community, but we don't leave our connection our concerns, our care for each other, our service to each other, to the world and to our faith continues. Until we are together again, friends, be strong, be well, be true, be loving. Let us now sing our closing blessing.